In Canada, a partially decomposed skeleton is found by the side of the road. Police suspect foul play, but determining who it is and time of death will be as tough as proving who committed the crime. In Colorado, a World War II hero is ambushed inside his house. Detectives enlist a battalion of metal detectors and a slab of roast beef to zero in on a killer. In a case of murder, the culprit may be a complete stranger or someone closer to home. To the astute detective and forensic specialist, the biggest clues often hide in plain sight. And what seems trivial to some is, in reality, critical evidence. Some of the names of the participants have been changed to protect their identity. In Ontario, Canada, spring thaw brings signs of new life. But on April 17, 2001, near the small town of Flanbury, the spring thaw revealed something far more gruesome. It was 3.40 p.m. when a jogger noticed a strange pile set among the weeds just off a rural highway. It was a horrific sight, a badly decomposed human body. The man quickly returned to the highway and ran for help. An emergency operator received the call and immediately dispatched members of the Hamilton Police Service. Officials cordoned off the area. Detective Sergeant Mike Thomas was put in charge of the case. Uh, when I arrived, uh, we saw a badly decomposed body uh, laying about uh, 12 to 15 feet from the roadway. But we're not... Uh, positive of what had happened, but we handled the scene uh, as, a, uh, as a major crime scene. There was little skin left, leaving the skull and bones exposed to the elements. Investigators had no idea if they were looking at the victim of a hit-and-run accident or possibly someone who had suffered a heart attack or some other serious illness and simply collapsed in the ditch. Their theory seemed unlikely when officials noted remnants of a black bra and nightgown. But it was the position of the body that intrigued pathologist Dr. David King. The left arm was down alongside the body, but the right arm was bent under the chest. It looked as if the body had uh, either been thrown or uh, rolled in that position. I thought that was significant. Typically in a hit, or hit and run, there are multiple fractures, the pelvis, the chest, what's called a bump of fracture on the lower legs. Dr. King observed no such injuries and ruled out that possibility. Detectives also found fingernails in the soil, a necklace and a wedding ring. The jewelry wasn't uh, extremely expensive jewelry, but it wasn't very cheap jewelry as well. Even though uh, through the decomposition we could see that the fingernails uh, um, at one time were well uh, manicured and, and groomed, and uh, certainly we didn't uh, uh, would not be consistent with uh, one of our street prostitutes that had been murdered and left out in this area. There was no way of knowing if the victim was a local or a stranger to the area. The remote site was adjacent to a farmer's field and not far from an African lion safari, an attraction that brought tourists from all over the province. 
The woman could be from anywhere. Her body was removed from the site and taken for autopsy. Investigators hoped they could find the clues they so desperately sought in the lab. Dr. David King performed the autopsy, declaring the victim to be female. The cause of death, blunt force trauma to the head. She had what's called depressed fracturing of the right side of the skull. That's in an area above her right ear. I think there were at least two blows, could be more, inflicted um, into the skull from the side. I think the victim was most, most probably taken by surprise, um, may well have been asleep in bed. Dr. King retrieved insect specimens from bodily tissues. The insects would help determine time of death. We did a, a number of other things to, uh, as we hoped, identify her. Um, uh, dental charting, we took samples for DNA. I removed several of the fingers with skin still on them in, in anticipation that uh, fingerprints could be obtained and she might be identified this way. Dr. Shelley Saunders, a forensic anthropologist at McMaster University, assisted Dr. King in evaluating the remains. The teeth are, if there's prominence of the, the area that where the teeth are She held, determined the victim's age and ethnicity. The nasal area here, the profile of the nasal area. I determined the individual was likely from Southern Asia, that is the subcontinent of India. Hamilton police contacted law enforcement throughout the U.S. and Canada, but there were no missing person reports matching that description. That was certainly uh, putting a huge wall up for us at the time, and um, our first priority had to be to, uh, to find out uh, who this uh, person was. To find the murder victim's identity, Detective Gary Zwicker was tasked with retrieving prints from the black mummified fingers collected at autopsy. I immersed them in a rehydration solution, checked them periodically, and I tried to obtain some prints. The rehydrating solution plumped up the mummified tissue like air filling a flat tire. The fingers were rehydrated, however, the skin was extremely hard and firm which didn't allow me to roll a proper impression at the time. If law enforcement officials couldn't identify who was murdered, they could at least figure out when. Dr. Dale Morris, a forensic entomologist, hoped to determine time of death using weather reports, mathematical equations, and data culled from bugs found at the scene. I found several different kinds of insects on the remains. The most important were the four species of blowflies. They lay their eggs on a dead body, sometimes within minutes of death, sometimes within hours of death. After determining the age of the insects, Dr. Morris simply counted backward from April. The insects had began uh, to colonize her remains the previous September came up with September 20th. Thanks, I have a media release that I will... On April 18th, 2001, one day after the body was found, Detective Mike Thomas held the first of several press conferences. Of April 2001, in the area of Concession 8. Uh, we often go to the media when we can't uh, identify a person. We released a number of photos uh, through the media, including the jewelry, the clothing that uh, the deceased was wearing. Tips came in, but uh, none of the tips uh, led to uh, any positive identification of the person. Things we'll be doing is uh, weeks passed, the and the police made no headway. Our website. Uh, we'll be putting these pictures on the website. Uh, hopefully, some, that might uh, be somewhat of an identifier. Then, Detective Alan Yates of the Forensic Identification Branch of the Hamilton Police Service came up with an idea. 
The fingers had been hydrated and expanded from the inside, but their outer surface remained hard and immobile, making it hard to get a fingerprint impression. I washed them in warm water. Uh, I used a waterless uh, base lanolin cream, massaging that cream into the fingers, trying to rehydrate the uh, fingers to a usable state so that uh, I could develop a decent fingerprint. Yates could see ridges, the whorls, loops, and arches that made these particular fingertips unique. He attempted another print. This time, they got a usable fingerprint. Detective Yates went to the APHIS computer for a match. The automated fingerprint identification system is a database maintained by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. It contains fingerprints of immigrants and anyone arrested for a crime. At that point, I sat in front of the computer comparing print against print, doing that several hundreds of times. Yates thought he had a match, but was too weary to trust his own judgment. Figured I'd better leave it till the next morning, come in with a fresh set of eyes. Upon returning the next morning, I reviewed the fingerprint for a matter of uh, approximately uh, 10 or 15 minutes, and then at that point I knew I had positively identified the unknown female. After seven weeks, police finally had a name to go with their body. In Canada, in 2001, the skeletal remains of a woman were found along the side of a rural highway. After seven months among the weeds and seven weeks as a Jane Doe, police finally knew her true identity. According to fingerprint records, her name was Yvette Boudram, a 38-year-old local woman with a volatile past. When the body was finally identified, that was a big break that we needed. Now we could move on to the next step of the investigation. Detective Mike Thomas of the Hamilton Police Service joined forces with Jamie Davis, a detective with the Peel Regional Police. Peel officials had arrested Yvette Boudram at her home on September 3rd, 2000. The charge, assault with a knife and making death threats against her husband. It also has in here all the notations. Yvette was released on bail, but disappeared soon after and never showed up for her court date. Now she was dead, and police wanted to speak with her husband. His name was Mohan Ramkasoon, and investigators asked him to come down to police headquarters. A decision was made to uh, not tell uh, Mohan Ramkasoon that his wife had been found dead. There was no evidence to say Mohan was responsible for the homicide. It was quite plausible that uh, he might know something uh, about her death, and we wanted to uh, explore it a little bit farther. I think there was a shooting? Where was that? Detective Davis conducted the interview. During the course of the interview, uh, Mohan appeared to be uh, very credible. But there was an uneasiness that we all had. And our gut instincts told us that something just wasn't right with some of his responses and the way that he conducted himself during the interview. And, you know, this guy, his, his name's... The couple was from Guyana and had immigrated to Canada. Ram Kassoon admitted to a rocky marriage, but knew nothing of his wife's whereabouts. He believed she'd abandoned him and their two small children. I think, I think he was from Tennessee. He said he was He suspected States. she'd run off with her lover, a man named Haroom Kumar. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it was all right for a couple of months. You know when that might happen? She'd last been seen by a friend on September 15th, 2000. I think Tennessee, yeah. yeah. This was in sync with forensic evidence, which suggested well, time of death was well, September 20th, give or take five days. Hoping to learn more about him, Detective Mike Thomas spoke with Lisa Boudram, Yvette's daughter from a previous marriage. 
the woman had no explanation for her mother's disappearance. It didn't seem right at the time because my mother, she's got two younger children and um, she would never leave without calling them or visiting them or even letting him know where she is. So that was out of character for her. And um, it just, the whole situation was very odd. Lisa Boudram recalled an incident from the previous September. Mohan mentioned that he was having problems taking care of the children and maintaining the household and everything else. And I said to him, I would be up there. I'll come and help you. Her assistance, however, was not welcomed. What I got from the conversation is that he clearly didn't want me at the house. And I was kind of worried, why would he not want me there? To detectives, such behavior seemed odd. But it did not prove murder. It came nowhere close. There was another person police wanted to speak with, Yvette's lover, Harun Kumar. Yvette's husband had heard that the man was a murder suspect, on the run from authorities in Tennessee. Thomas placed calls to the United States to find out more details. Uh, there was no question that uh, Vett and Kumar were having, uh, were having a, a relationship, and it was quite blatant, and Mohan was aware of it. Um, it was important that uh, we make attempts to uh, locate Kumar and get his side of the story. That would be harder than expected. The next day, police met with a former roommate of Kumar. An illegal alien from Southeast Asia, Kumar had been hiding in a Montreal apartment in September of 2000. He'd been trying to avoid Yvette, to whom he owed thousands of dollars. He left the country and was smuggled into the United States the day that uh, that uh, a vet, uh, we believe, was murdered. That was uh, a suspicious event that uh, certainly uh, required further investigation. With Kumar on the loose, somewhere in America, investigators realized they had to break the news to Ram Kassoum. It was decided that we better tell Mohan that, he, uh, that his wife's been uh, found and, and uh, she has been killed. On June 13, 2001, Detective Davis called the man, asking him to come down to police headquarters one last time. We just wanted to give him the information face to face. We'll speak to you, but it is important that we speak to you as soon as possible. When I indicated to him that I wanted to speak to him again, there was a long pause on the phone. That's when he started doing. I contacted a lawyer. You need to. You can speak with my lawyer. Now, why do you think? This caused me immediate concern, because certainly in my experience, it is not uh, normal or usual for the husband uh, of a missing person victim to uh, contact a lawyer, and, uh, that uh, either his lawyer or he'll be back in touch with us. And I gotta tell you, like, when I told him we wanted him to come back in here, he sounded panic-stricken. That really concerned me. All right, we've got the surveillance. Fortunately, we had a surveillance unit that was available that morning, and um, they were watching Mohan. Mohan Ramkissoon left his workplace in the middle of the day, just minutes after his phone call with Detective Davis. Undercover officers tailed Ramkissoon to his attorney's office, where he spent a few minutes inside. Then he was off to a nearby shopping mall, to a destination that grabbed investigators' attention. He left work immediately, went over to a travel agency. A surveillance unit was right in the travel agency when he was arguing that he wanted the next ticket out of Canada to Guyana, three one-way tickets to Guyana and uh, the flight was uh, leaving in about 90 minutes and they were trying to convince him that you're not gonna make it. 
Finally, Ram Kassoon gave in. Uh, it took some time for the travel agency to convince him to get the next flight on the following day. Two hours before his international flight, Ram Kassoon's car was spotted entering long-term parking. Police surrounded the vehicle. His children were swept away as their father was taken into custody. Put your hands up on the car. Dad! Daddy! Okay. Daddy was okay. Well, when Mohan was arrested at the airport, uh, it was... Uh, he was just, uh, you could just feel the energy fall out of his body. Uh, it, it was like uh, he realized that the gig was up. Uh, uh, he wasn't going to be able to escape. He wasn't going to be able to get out uh, of Canada. When we searched Lo Mohan's luggage, we located some photographs of he and his family at the African Lion Safari, which of course was in close proximity to where Yvette's body had been found. Mohan. After he was arrested at the airport, we conducted about a uh, nine-hour interrogation of uh, Mohan. He uh, just uh, insisted that he was not responsible for this. Uh, unfortunately, he, uh, we could not get an admission from him on that particular night. And, uh, and a decision was made to, uh, to uh, release him. And should he make attempts to leave the country again, we continue to uh, maintain sur physical surveillance on him uh, so that we know his whereabouts at all times. Investigators obtained a search warrant for the Ram Kassoon home. Detective Dave Emberlin conducted the search. And we started in the bedroom because the victim was found wearing a nightgown. And upon flipping the mattress over, we noticed a uh, approximate two foot by 18 inch hole had been cut out of the mattress up near the top of the bed. That indicated to us that something had happened in this room and our job is to find it. We subsequently got on our hands and knees and started looking anywhere and everywhere looking for tiny, minute blood spatter. The floor was very shiny, the baseboard appeared to be uh, freshly painted. It was a very clean room. After about two hours of going over every square inch of the bedroom, we didn't find anything and it was starting to become quite frustrating because you, you have that gut feeling that something's happened here. They had found nothing. They were about to give up. And I just for unknown reasons, started to press the end of my flashlight, illuminating the light. But as soon as the light hit it, it was like jackpot. We've we found something here. On the television set was the critical evidence they were looking for. In June 2001, Canadian authorities were on the trail of a man who they believed had killed his wife and dumped her body in the woods. Detective Dave Emberlin theorized the murder had occurred at home, and a TV set gave him his first shot at real proof. Under normal uh, room lighting, uh, black TV, it, it didn't really show up. But under the flashlight, there it was. Detective Bernie Weber of the Peel Regional Police performed a blood test with a hemostick. In order to utilize this, uh, you wet the uh, hemostick and you place it on the stain, a chemical reaction occurs. If it's blood, it actually turns the uh, stick green. The stain tested positive for blood. Detectives returned to the mattress. There was a strange hole, but no visible blood stains. At least, not visible to the naked eye. A luminol test revealed the truth. A bloodied uh, object or person had been on the uh, mattress, and an object or a person which had been wet with blood had made contact with the side of the television and then had moved across the face of it. Detectives also conducted a search of Ram Kassoon's car. Like his house, it was remarkably clean.
free of stray hairs and fibers. And there appear to be no blood stains. Detective Weber once again applied the luminol. This was located on the weather stripping of the vehicle as well as the inner trunk carpet. DNA from the victim was compared to DNA samples taken from the blood stains in the bedroom and the stains in the car trunk. Blood stains from the television set came back inconclusive. All the other genetic profiles matched. All the evidence in this investigation pointed towards Mohan. Uh, the blood uh, around the, uh, the hole that had been cut out in the mattress was a vet's. The blood in the trunk of the car was a vet's. That information combined with uh, Mohan's actions um, when uh, trying to flee the country. Police were also able to eliminate Harun Kumar, Yvette's lover, as a suspect. Phone records and hotel bills provided him an alibi. Ram Kassoon had told police that Kumar was a murder suspect in Tennessee, trying to divert attention from his own guilt. Hey guys, I got a fax here from uh, states here. For the cooperation. We were able to track down uh, Kumar in the United States, and uh, he was cooperative. Uh, all the information that he provided uh, to us was uh, corroborated. On August 16, 2001, Mohan Ram Kassoon was arrested at his home without incident. Detectives theorized that her husband sneaked up on her while Yvette lay sleeping. In a jealous rage over her blatant infidelity, he struck and killed her with a long cylindrical object, perhaps a bat or tire iron. In February 2004, Mohan Ram Kassoon was found guilty of second degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison. The majority of homicides involve victims who know their killers. But when the killers are strangers and there is no motive, police are left scrambling for clues. October 20th, 1993. Just off a rural highway in Boulder County, Colorado, a cleaning woman approached the home of Walter Yoakum. When Yoakum did not respond, the woman went around back and made a frightening discovery. Shattered glass from a broken window. Worried, she ran to contact police. Officer Kyle Miller and his partner from the Boulder County Sheriff's Department arrived on the scene. The cleaning woman informed them that her employer, Walter Yoakum, was an elderly man. For years, she was cleaning for him, for at least three years. Uh, and every two weeks, on those, he would open the door for her, and this is the first time that he hadn't opened the door. Deputies suspected one or more intruders might still be inside. What they found instead was a gruesome sight. An elderly man sprawled at the bottom of a staircase. Walter Yoakum was identified from his driver's license. The 76-year-old was dead, shot in the neck. Crime scene investigators quickly secured the area. Detective Tony Matthews was put in charge of the case. My first impression was it was gonna be a difficult case to solve. Most murder cases typically are someone known to the victim. This looked like, you know, the victim had been at home, somebody came into his house and shot him. Detective Bruce Norton helped process the crime scene. At the point of entry to the house, there was broken glass, um, both inside and outside the window frame. And there was really good footprints out there that led up to the window. Norton worked on recovering the footprints. 
while Detective Matthews checked out the interior. But investigators came up empty. They could only determine the obvious. The suspect or suspects appeared to have entered through a ground floor window, stepping in and onto a bed. Plaques and medals on the wall revealed that Walter Yoakum was a veteran and a hero from World War II. Mr. Yoakum was a uh, waste gunner in a B-17 in World War II, and he survived 34 missions over Nazi-held territory, which is, if you're familiar with history, that's quite a feat. I mean, you know, often in these raids, you know, 10, 10 or 20 or 30 percent of the planes would go down. So to survive 34 missions was amazing. The gunshot was a through and through. Matthews observed an entrance wound in the front of the neck, an exit wound out the back. Detective Matthews found small spatters of blood on the upper floor landing. It appeared that Yoakum had been standing at the top of the stairs when shot and tumbled down to the floor below. Under a nearby chair, the deputy found an empty holster but there was no sign of a gun or the fatal bullet. In any case involving a gunshot wound, you want to find the bullet because bullets can be ballistically matched to the weapon that fired them. They found no bullets embedded in the walls, just a strange powdery substance at the top of the stairs. The bullet had torn through the roof with only a few flecks of crumbled ceiling plaster to point the way. The bullet had traveled through Mr. Yoakum, and at an upward angle, it had gone through the ceiling and through the roof and out into space. So we then began searching outside the house, the entire roof of the house, the gutters, all of the areas right around the house, up, you know, basically to the entire property line, and we did not find that bullet. Without the bullet, investigators would not be able to identify the murder weapon, and this case would be nearly impossible to solve. Trip DeMuth from the Boulder County District Attorney's Office specialized in cases of violent crimes. The first day when I was on the scene, I was walking, did the walkthrough and uh, was in the front yard. I was seriously doubtful about whether or not we would be able to solve this case. The only solid lead was a partial print made by someone wearing a lug-soled boot. Detective Norton made a plaster cast of the print. It turned out to be the first in a trail of steps that led police away from the house. Looks like it might be the same type going off in this direction from over there. Detective Norton followed the trail, hoping it would lead to more clues. Those shoe patterns actually went out across the field, up this little service road, and then um, across Dillon Road to another, like a pullout area along the side of the road. And we took several castings of the, the footprints that were alongside the road. Norton also found tire tracks. They were not deep enough for plaster casts, but confirmed his suspicions. The suspect parked a short distance away, which is real consistent with how a burglar operates. They don't want to park right in front of the, the house. And it appears to, appear to us that it was probably an interrupted burglary. And once the, the homeowner was shot, the suspects left very quickly. They wanted to get out of the area. Deputies canvassed the neighborhood, but found no witnesses to the crime. Yoakum's next door neighbors had seen the man the day before. He'd been painting a fence and appeared to be in good spirits. To his neighbors, he seemed as kind as he was ordinary. He was a retired accountant, a widower, the father of two, with several grandchildren. They could not imagine anyone who would want to hurt him. At the Boulder County Sheriff's Department,
deputies, detectives, and crime scene technicians gathered for a task force meeting led by Tony Matthews. Matthews told his men to be on the lookout for a gun missing from Yoakum's home. It was a U.S. Army pistol, which he kept in the holster found at the scene. The family members were able to describe that in great detail for us. You know, it was the weapon that he had kept from World War II. That gun was his memento. Whether it was also the murder weapon, however, was still unclear. Yoakum's was a 45 caliber gun, but the bullet hole found in the roof was small and could have been made by a 38 Special. The first thing that so we needed is, uh, was to locate and identify the murder weapon oh, and then put that murder weapon in somebody's hands. Desperate to find a witness, investigators distributed flyers yes, and conducted traffic stops. Good. I'm Officer Miller from Board County Sheriff's Department. We have um, some flyers in here. We were looking for people that had driven by that day. Maybe they saw a car, maybe they saw somebody walking, that sort of thing. But detectives gained no useful leads. I, mean, I would have loved to have had a witness who had seen somebody leaving the crime scene, uh, but that wasn't the case here. So the only way to piece this case together was through forensics. To catch a killer, detectives would have to construct a most unusual forensic experiment, one that involved metal detectors, drywall, and a slab of roast beef. In 1993, 76-year-old Walter Yoakum was found shot to death in his Colorado home, the apparent victim of a burglary gone wrong. It was a brutal end to a heroic life. Yoakum had earned commendations for bravery in World War II. Detective Tony Matthews found no fingerprints, no weapon, not even the bullet that killed Yoakum only a series of boot prints leading to and from the house. We put the word out with all the local departments um, nearby, you know, anybody you can think of that's doing residential burglaries, let us know names. Yes, sir. The nearby Louisville police precinct okay. gave them two, Jason Fowler and Adam Bailey. Okay. They were kids that were doing that type of burglary. Louisville officials had tried to nab the two recently in a drug sting, but the duo managed to escape in a pickup with out-of-state plates. Okay. We ran the plate, and uh, the plate listed to a third person, uh, who at that time we weren't aware of. It was a man named Kevin Doctor. We're looking into a homicide here, and I had a name I wanted to run past you, of a local resident there. His name's uh, Kevin Doctor. Well, one of our detectives called up to North Dakota to find out more about him. Coincidentally, he had been arrested the previous day. Of course, one thing led to another. We, we asked, well, what did you arrest him for? And they said, well, he's a convicted felon and he's in possession of firearms. And we asked, what kind of weapons did he have? And they said, well, he's got a 357 revolver and an old Army uh, 45, which then, of course, immediately piqued our interest thinking, okay, that's very likely going to be our victim's gun that's missing. That was the first lead we had as to who may have been involved in this case. With Doctor already in jail in North Dakota on a weapons charge, Colorado police had only to locate his accomplices, who were still at large. On November 2nd, 1993, two weeks after the murder, police spotted Adam Bailey in Boulder County, Colorado. Apprehended without incident. With his criminal record, he already was a habitual offender, and so he had a lot to lose. He talked to us fairly quickly, telling us that Kevin Doctor and Jason Fowler had done this burglary and that Doctor shot uh, Mr. Yoakum. Bailey claimed he'd learned about the killing from his friend, Jason Fowler. But when Fowler was nabbed by police, he asked for a lawyer and refused to talk.
If Bailey was telling the truth, one of the guns in Doctor's possession was likely the murder weapon. Kevin Doctor was in possession of a 357 Magnum and a World War II issue 45 caliber weapon. We needed to be able to prove both that that 45 was in fact the victims, and we needed to be able to prove that the uh, 357 in Kevin Doctor's possession was in fact the murder weapon. The main reason we got this boneless is to determine if it was the murder weapon. Investigators had to find the elusive bullet. Was shot in an area where there was no bone. No bone was hit right there. Detective Matthews enlisted the aid of sheriff's deputy Ray Sarno. We have the challenge uh, for me was to find the bullet, the needle in the haystack, and uh, I wanted to narrow down the haystack. He would need to find the fatal so we, bullet. We've got, we've got it in the right order because he reenacted the shooting at a local firing range. And then it passed through the ceiling. It passed through the drywall. Okay, I'm sorry, the drywall, which is the ceiling. We needed to determine what. Uh, velocity the bullet lost after it passed through the poor victim and also the ceiling and the roof and if we could determine that then we could literally narrow the field down that we were going to search we measured distances from uh, the shooter to the victim and the victim to the ceiling from the ceiling to the roof sarno used shingles and tar paper to simulate the roof drywall for the ceiling and a rump roast purchased at a local supermarket to serve as the victim. A chronograph would measure the bullet's velocity as it passed through each layer. Sarno used a 357 Magnum confiscated from Kevin Doctor. The gun can fire 38 caliber bullets, which investigators believed had been used in the crime. aimed and fired. The shot was successful and went through the meat, it went through the drywall, it went through the uh, roofing material, and it did record on the chronograph. It registered. Get, write this down. The chronograph detected a reduction in speed, limiting the distance One, two, the bullet could travel to 700 feet. 1,218 feet per second. Yeah. Feet per second. yeah. It did it. Scores of deputies and volunteers canvassed the property behind Yoakum's house. They used the test results to narrow the search area, focusing their attention 700 feet from the site of the murder. Metal detectors were uh, the key to the search because we were looking for something that was basically invisible. It could have been half an inch under the soil. So we needed to make the invisible visible. And I was determined, obsessed, tenacious that I was going to find that murder bullet, if not me, somebody else on my team. After two days with no results, the search team became weary and disheartened. Perhaps all their work had been for nothing. Then, suddenly, a reading on one of the devices indicated the presence of metal beneath the surface. Within seconds, investigators found the bullet that had eluded them for weeks. The bullet was sent to agent Ted Ritter, a firearms expert at the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. It was in pretty damaged condition, being fired through the ceiling and on out through the rafters. The actual marks that would have been caused by it being fired through the barrel of a firearm had been overmarked, kind of like uh, if you compared it to taking a piece of sandpaper and sanding a piece of metal. It causes additional scratches on the surface of that metal. Well, that's exactly what happened on this fired bullet. Because of the damage, Ritter would not be able to match the bullet to Kevin Doctor's gun. Detectives soon got worse news. Kevin Doctor had made bail in North Dakota. Police had found their elusive bullet and lost their prime suspect. In 1993, Colorado authorities had arrested burglar Adam Bailey in connection with the slaying of war veteran Walter Yoakum. 
Bailey gave up his friends, Jason Fowler, who had helped break into the Yoakum house, and Kevin Doctor, a career criminal who allegedly committed the murder. Detective Tony Matthews. We needed to have some evidence that would link Kevin Doctor to the crime scene. And what we really had at that point, we had the weapons um, and footprints. And that was pretty much it. Forensic expert Ted Ritter had been unable to prove that the bullet found near Yoakum's house was fired from Doctor's gun. He did, however, examine the specific chemical composition of the lead in the mangled bullet. He found it to be very similar to the lead in other bullets found in Doctor's gun. It was not an absolute match, but it was close. More good news came from North Dakota. Doctor was back in jail. He violated his bond and got rearrested. And when that happened, we were able to get his boots. The boots were sent to Special Agent Donald Sollers at the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. I used a fingerprint powder. I applied tape to it. I lifted it. Sollers created a transparent overlay, which he used to compare with the boot prints found at the scene. The general wear in the heel area and the ball area were consistent with the crime scene track and what was present on each of the boots. Again, another match. News that Colorado officials wanted to deliver to Kevin Doctor personally. He was extradited from North Dakota to Colorado. When confronted with the overwhelming evidence, the suspect eventually confessed to the crime. Doctor had entered the house alone, leaving Fowler outside as a lookout. Walter Yoakum was asleep upstairs. Walter Yoakum heard the, break, the breaking glass, um, and he had his gun handy. It was in a holster, he pulled it out, went to the top of the stairs, and probably was shouting down to find out who was downstairs or what was the cause of this noise. Um, Kevin Doctor was laying in wait at the bottom of the staircase. I was personally moved because I'm kind of a student of history and I've you know, studied a lot about World War II anyway. To me, it hits home what kind of sacrifice he made for, you know, his country and in the war, and then, you know, he makes it through all of that and then gets killed in his own house in that way. Jason Fowler pled guilty to burglary and received a 25-year prison sentence. Adam Bailey was charged with burglary and received probation in exchange for cooperating with prosecutors. Kevin Doctor pled guilty to second-degree murder. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison. When faced with a homicide, police must evaluate strangers and spouses alike. But with forensic tools like luminol, metal detectors, even supermarket meat, clever investigators can outwit the coolest of killers while preserving the most critical evidence.